In this part of the lesson, we want to talk about where the sun gets its energy. And in ancient times, um, people thought the sun was on fire. And then in the 19th century, they thought it was some type of chemical reaction. And it wasn't until Albert Einstein, at the beginning of the 20th century, developed his theories of relativity. And in his theory of relativity, um, we learned that energy and mass are interchangeable. And his famous equation, E equals mc squared, um, is what allows the sun to work. And he, in this equation, m is a quantity of mass in kilograms. C is the speed of light, 3 times 10 to the 8 meters per second. And E is the amount of energy. So you can take energy and create mass. You can take mass and create energy is what that law tells us. The speed of light is a very large number, so the speed of light squared is an incredibly large number. So in the 1920s, Robert Atkinson suggested that the sun gets its energy from nuclear fusion. And nuclear fusion is when you take two atomic nuclei and join them together into a larger nucleus. In this case, he suggested maybe hydrogen nuclei fused together to produce helium. This process of producing helium from hydrogen is called hydrogen burning, although you have to be careful here because nothing is truly burning. It's a nuclear reaction that is taking place. And this hydrogen burning is a special case of what we call thermonuclear fusion. So what is thermonuclear fusion? Well, if you recall, a hydrogen nucleus is just a single proton, and helium is two protons and two neutrons. So what Atkinson proposed was that we could take four hydrogen nuclei, put them together to form helium, plus some extra energy because the mass of the helium was less than the mass of the four hydrogen nuclei. Well, if we do this, we're going to produce energy. If you take four hydrogen atoms, you have a total mass of 6.7 times 10 to the minus 27 kilograms. If you subtract off the mass of the resulting helium, which is 6.6 .6 times 10 to the minus 27 kilograms, you find that you lose 0 0.048 times 10 to the minus 27 kilograms of mass. Well, that mass is converted to energy. And that energy then, if you take that mass that you've lost and multiply it by c squared, is 4.3 times 10 to the minus 12 joules. Well, that doesn't sound like a whole lot of energy, but when you think about the size of the nucleus and how many there are, let's say we burn one kilogram of hydrogen. So a simple kilogram or 2.2 pounds of hydrogen would give us 6.3 times 10 to the 14 joules. That is 10,000 times more than any chemical reaction. So this is a very powerful reaction and releases a lot of energy. So the way this happens in the sun is called the proton-proton chain. And this happens in a series of events, and 85% of the energy occurs in this proton-proton chain. And this proton chain happens in three steps. So the first step is I have two single hydrogen nuclei and these hydrogen nuclei are moving around very rapidly in the core of the sun. They're under tremendous pressure and tremendous density, and on many occasions, these protons will bump into each other. Now, you know they both have positive charge, so they're repelling each other, so there has to be a force stronger than the electromagnetic force that causes them to repel, and that force is the strong nuclear force. And if I can get two protons close enough together that the strong force overwhelms the electromagnetic force, they will bind together. Of course, two positive particles don't want to stay together, so one of those protons is going to convert into a neutron, and it's going to release two new particles when it does that, and it's going to do this through a process we call beta decay. Actually, it's a weak nuclear force process, and the process of a proton going into a neutron is actually referred to as inverse beta decay. And when a proton turns into a neutron, it has to conserve momentum, it has to conserve electric charge, so in the process, it creates a positron, or the antimatter particle of an electron, and a electron neutrino, a new particle. And we can see these electron neutrinos coming from the sun, and it's one way we know that this, what's happening in the core of the sun is what we believe it is. Of course, the positive, positron is going to meet up with an electron very quickly and annihilate with that electron as matter-antimatter pairs and produce gamma rays, which is part of the energy that's being produced in the process. The second step in the process is I take my deuterium, which is my, my proton and my neutron from step one, 
and another proton gets close enough to those to join and it makes a more stable nucleus which is a form of helium it's one of helium's isotopes and it's a rare isotope of helium called helium 3 and it also in the process releases some energy in the form of a gamma ray um, this gamma ray then is carried out of the core and into the radiative zone where it is part of the power of the sun so my deuterium combining with another proton produces helium 3 in step 2 now step one and two has to occur twice in two separate places because step three requires two helium-3 nuclei. And these two helium-3 nuclei will come together, so I'll get a collision of two helium-3, and they will bind, and two of the protons will come out of that collision. And what I'm left then is a stable isotope of helium called helium-4. And that's what we looked at and calculated the energy for at the beginning of this, and we saw that I ended up taking four protons, and I've produced helium, which is two protons and two neutrons, and released quite a bit of energy in the process. So the end result is I have four hydrogen nuclei, or four protons. They're converted to one helium-4 nucleus, two positrons, and two neutrinos, plus gamma rays in the form of energy. So this is a diagram of the entire process. And you want to be familiar with this process. So the next thing we want to do then is where does this energy go? How does this energy get out of the sun? And this energy reaches us from the core. And in the core, I have my nuclear fusion taking place under tremendous pressures and tremendous temperatures. And the energy coming out of the core then is mainly in the form of radiation. So it's in the form of gamma rays and light. And that enters a very hot, dense plasma in the radiative zone. And in this plasma, the light bounces off of the charged particles. And it takes about 100,000 years for that photon to bounce around and work its way out of the radiative zone to the convective zone. Once I get to the convective zone, the pressure has been reduced enough and the density has been reduced enough that the photon is able to recombine with atoms, exciting those atoms and heating them and giving them more kinetic energy. And then I get a convective process. So the heat then is carried through convection to the surface of the photosphere. And in the photosphere, I excite those atoms and they emit light and create magnetic fields which create everything else that we come from the sun. So that's how the energy gets from the core. It takes about 100,000 years to get through the radiative zone. It takes only a few days to come up through the convective zone, and then it only takes eight minutes once it leaves the sun to reach us. So there's lots of different ways that I can produce energy that the Earth gets from the sun. Um, I have light in the form of the sunlight, I have x-rays, I have radio waves, so those are all forms of light coming from the sun. I get high energy charged particles and magnetic storms and a solar wind which we discussed earlier. Well, how long does it take those things to reach the Earth? Well, the sunlight which comes from the photosphere which I just discussed is 8 minutes, about 8.2 minutes to reach the Earth. If I have a solar flare, it's a very high energy event and produces x-rays. And these x-rays are light, so they also take eight minutes. And then I get a lot of radio noise from all the gases in the chromosphere and corona oscillating around. And these radio waves are also light, so they also take eight minutes to reach us. Now when I have a solar flare um, or a coronal mass ejection, I have very strong energetic particles, but they're not traveling the speed of light. So from a solar flare, the charged particles, the energetic particles reach us in about a day. I also create a magnetic storm, and a magnetic storm could last over a period of a couple of days, and that takes three to four days to reach us. And then the solar wind is about four to 10 days for particles coming out of the solar wind or the coronal particles to reach us. Space weather is the field that studies how what's going on on the sun affects us here on the Earth in our near space environment and on the space environment on other planets. For a large eruption, the sun produces a flash of light 
which we call the solar flare. It also produces a huge ball of material traveling away from the sun we call the coronal mass ejection. And both of those phenomena can accelerate subatomic particles, which we call solar energetic particles. These three things together make up a solar storm. A coronal mass ejection, or CME, is an eruption of plasma from the sun that shoots out into space, and it could affect us here at Earth. A solar flare is a huge release of energy that converts the magnetic energy of the sun into heat, into light. It accelerates particles and can really heat up the plasma in order of minutes to over 60 million Kelvin. Solar energetic particles are particles of plasma that are accelerated at the flare site from the energy that's released in the flare. And these particles can be accelerated up to almost 80% of the speed of light. And a coronal mass ejection, when it's traveling so fast, creates a shock. And that can create solar energetic particles. Solar flares and CMEs are all driven by magnetic reconnection. This is where the sun turns up the magnetic field and then it causes oppositely directed magnetic fields to then annihilate. But you can't just, just get rid of magnetic, you can't just get rid of energy, you have to convert that energy and transfer that energy into other things such as plasma motions, um, accelerating the plasma, heating up the plasma, um, and also giving out more light. But a CME is that material and that magnetic field line just getting thrown away from the sun due to this interaction. Whereas a flare is the sort of close to the surface phenomena where the twisting and the snapping occurs and therefore you get all this heat and kinetic energy. So how is the Earth protected from these solar weather events? Well, as you know, the Earth is surrounded by a magnetic field, and this magnetic field can deflect the particles coming from the sun. Um, the upper level of the atmosphere deflects a lot of the light or absorbs it, and the charged particles that are deflected change the Earth's magnetic field. It creates a tail behind the Earth. And since some of the particles are going to get drawn into the Earth's magnetic field, they're going to get pulled towards the poles, where the magnetic field guides are really close, and they get pulled down into our atmosphere. And when this happens, these charged particles will interact with the elements or the molecules in the atmosphere, and those molecules will get excited, and then they will de-excite, emitting light, and it creates an event called the Northern Lights. And the Northern Lights happen in the Northern and Southern Hemisphere. They're also called the Aurora Borealis. And they're a very beautiful event to observe. The most common color for the Northern Lights is green. And on rare higher energy events, you'll get reds and purples and they're in a constant state of flux or a constant changing motion and they tend to form these long streamers and they're an incredibly beautiful event if you ever have a chance to travel to the northern latitudes um, during the winter um, you want to keep an eye out for the northern lights and i would recommend at some point in your life you should make an effort to go and see the northern lights Solar flares and coronal mass ejections do not always hit Earth. They happen all over the sun, and depending on where on the sun they occur, determines whether or not they're gonna to travel towards the Earth. Some of them could be shot off to the side and just miss us completely. Um, they could go up, they could go left. Uh, some are like curveballs that uh, a pitcher will throw. They could seemingly come straight for us and then miss us completely. Space weather can have several different effects on the Earth and the near-Earth environment. In space, it can create dangerous radiation in the form of particles, which is detrimental to the health of astronauts. These particles, as well as solar flares, can cause damage to satellites in near-Earth orbit. In addition, 
Electromagnetic disturbances created by geomagnetic storms can affect power transmission on the ground, can also disrupt communication, but space weather has no direct effect on human beings themselves. We are protected here on the surface of the Earth from solar flares and coronal mass ejections when they impact the Earth due to the magnetic field of the Earth called the magnetosphere, which deflects the, the magnetic field and the energetic particles, as well as the atmosphere, which absorbs the higher levels of radiation. Most of the energy that's associated with a solar flare or a coronal mass ejection doesn't even reach the surface of the Earth. So even the biggest of flares isn't going to affect you here at Earth. When a large solar eruption occurs, there are generally three things that happen. Each of these takes a different amount of time to reach the Earth. The solar flare, because it's light, travels at the speed of light and takes approximately eight minutes to reach us. The solar energetic particles are traveling extremely fast, close to the speed of light, but not exactly the speed of light. So they take roughly 20 to 30 minutes to reach us. The coronal mass ejection is much slower and that takes about one to four days to reach us. The sun goes through what we call a solar activity cycle, where every 11 years on average, it will go from a very low period of solar activity, meaning sunspots and solar storms, to another period of low activity. And in between, it goes through what we call solar maximum. At solar maximum, the sun has a very complicated magnetic field structure, and therefore it creates a lot more sunspots and a lot more solar storms like flares and CMEs. It's very important to be able to forecast solar events because they can affect our technology, our satellites, they can cause power grids to be affected. So as we become more and more technologically advanced, it becomes more important to be able to forecast such events. So how are we advancing our knowledge of the sun? And we have several experiments and several observatories in the sky and several more planned. Um, here is a example of um, some of the satellites we have that we're using to study the sun. Um, you're familiar with the um, SOHO and SDO. Um, the people that just spoke to you were with the SDO or the Solar Dynamics Observatory Project. Um, the solar observer is proposed, there's a solar probe proposed. So um, there are many of these things because understanding the sun is incredibly important as we become more and more dependent on technology. Um, the chances of a solar event um, destroying our technology or our energy grid are not small. So it's important to be able to make predictions on these events. So this is an important thing to study. So studying the sun can be very important for the future of the race and of the Earth itself. So it's an important thing to understand. We're going to take our understanding of how the sun works and expand that to understand how other stars work. And we'll do that in the next lesson. So as always, feel free to contact me with any questions or concerns you may have.